in order to enlighten ourselves, in order to get into a dialogue, but not necessarily to create controversy that we would like to say right from the outset. We are quite aware that this topic is controversial. We are quite aware that this topic may lend itself to differences of opinion. And we have no problem with that. This is a research center and we do a lot of scholarly exchanges. So right from the outset, we would like to lay down this very clearly. A brief word of welcome to our two, uh, one is the speaker and the other is the moderator. The speaker, as you see, Alan Machado, is a person who is well known in circles of history, but also in other issues of culture, language, etc. He is an engineer by profession, but he's published also in these areas of the social sciences. So we're very happy, Alan, that you have agreed to come and spend some time with us. He's not new to ACHR, and I think he's not new to many of you in the audience. And if there are any more details to be mentioned, I leave it to Jason. I say a brief word about Jason, the moderator. Jason too is not new to XHR. He has been here before. He has worked here in our library. He has lectured here on occasions. And so we are very happy to welcome him back. He's now come back with a doctorate that he did abroad and he has got a PhD now and he works uh, I think in Lisbon University Institute and uh, therefore has wide experiences uh, as an anthropologist but also in other fields as we know very well today all research is done in a cross-disciplinary manner and so anthropologists also talk to other social scientists and interact with them. So history is not very far away from anthropology and so there is a lot of interaction. Besides, Jason also has a degree in law, which is very rare for us in the social sciences to have a colleague in law. And so that makes his discussions also very exciting and very interesting because his perspectives are different from those of us trained essentially in the social science in the into the social sciences. Having said that, I just would like to get the ball rolling and so I just want to tell you that in the beginning the speaker will present to us the content of his book which he has published recently and he will talk about. And then uh, Dr. Jason Keith Fernandez will moderate the session so that it remains fluid and it remains fluent and we don't get stuck on any one issue and that is not the purpose of this, this evening. However, if you have further questions that need uh, discussion and so on and greater depth, you can approach either of them, but particularly the speaker of the evening because he has published the book on the Goa Inquisition. So having said these few, having made these few remarks, I hand over now to Jason Keith Fernandez, you can take over and eventually invite us. Thank you very much. Um, I don't, I don't believe this. This microphone works. No, this one. No, not this. Hello. Okay. Um, so good evening. I I want to stay between you and the. Speaker, very well. Um, I just want to lay a few ground rules before we begin. Um, there will be a, a, a Q&A, a question and answer session after the presentation. So if we could all hold our questions until then. I mean, this is the norm in most of the lectures here. Um, so we just follow that norm. Two, right from the very outset, I'd like to bear in mind that tonight we're not here to establish the truth. Yeah. Um, the truth is not going to be established tonight. We are here only to listen to the considered and scholarly opinion of uh, Mr. Prabhu and subsequent to which we will have questions to clarify any doubts we have. Yeah. Um, so 
without further ado, I give you uh, Mr. Alan Mushabhu. Thank you, Jason and Tony and friends. Thank you all for coming. Uh, let me say that I have not come here to defend the Inquisition. I can't hear. Not Christians, not non-Christians, not anything else, but Goans. 
and this was the time when Priyorka's book came out. That was in, in 1961. The Priyorka has done a very good job, honest job, but there are certain deficiencies which I'll point out. Uh, he was aware of primary sources that were there because he quotes from Adler's book, a lot of primary sources, and knew that he knew that this documentation was available at in the Lisbon, in Lisbon, in the Biblioteca National, and uh, as well as in the Torah But uh, his book, about a third of it, is confined to the narratives of just a reproduction of narratives by Delon and Buchanan, uh, which is again selective because Buchanan wrote a lot of other things about the Jagannath Yatra and other things which were in a very uh, derogatory tone, but he never quotes that. He also uh, devotes quite a bit of time to space to try to show the authenticity of Delon's narrative, which of course it was, and, it, and all those about 10 or 12 pages of it, which would have been dismissed in a single page if I had written it, because Delon's name is mentioned in the 1774 inventory, which was compiled in Goa. His name is clearly written. So, there's no point, I mean, you don't need anything more than just saying the name is there in the inventory created by the inquisitors. Uh, we don't need to go and prove all these sort of things. So, when he writes something, let me read this out, but uh, see, when, when, when Priyorka writes, the story of the inquisition is a dismal record of callousness and cruelty, tyranny and injustice, espionage and blackmail, avarice and corruption, repression of thought, and culture and promotion of obscurantism. It's good rhetoric. And it came at a time when there was an attempt to link the uh, actions of the Portuguese government to uh, uh, the black legend of the Inquisition. But much of it is, uh, I think if he had read some of the primary sources and based his book on that, he may have had a different opinion. I don't know but I would have liked, loved to have discussed with him on this. But he was not the only one with this narrative. There were a lot of Christian bones, and one of them was the foremost freedom fighter that you have here, that is Tristav Braganza Puna. Puna was such a uh, uh, fighter for Goa's freedom that he was uh, taken to Lisbon and put in prison there. I think the other gentleman was Breton there, was also there, and some others like that. So they were in the same boat, they were fighting for this. That's why I said it is a time of conflict that you select a target and attack that target. And that in this case, because uh, in the Anglo-centric, uh, this one it was not only Spain but also Catholicism, the attack took place. Buchanan, it came to Protestantism and English dominance. Here if you are fighting for your own freedom, Goans were fighting for it. And in these sort of situations, you can go into rhetoric and other things. But then you come down to what is really history based on what evidence is available. You need to go to primary evidence for a lot of things, not even on secondary sources. Secondary sources are fine in certain things, but primary sources are, are the main thing by which you, you sort of sift, analyze, or compare, and it takes a long, long, long time to do this. So what are these primary sources we are talking about? See, yeah, so, so, sorry, uh, but if, if you have missed something, you can always uh, beg, borrow, or buy a book, or, or you can uh, have a look at the note that has been put up, I think now it's quite clear, the, the note that we put up, and I am happy, if anybody wants to contact me, I am happy to guide you to any source that you want to research or see for yourself. So these primary sources. Now, the one with the maximum amount of uh, uh, documentation is the Akhargo Torah de Dome in Lisbon. It's the National Archive. You find one, an enormous amount of primary sources available on the Inquisition files, uh, which Lisbon, Coimbra, Evora, and the Goa, Goa's Inquisition you are free to access this. This is freely available on the net. You can download it sitting comfortably in your own room, in your own house. 
the type of information you get here is the documentation that took place, the guidelines that were given. Uh, there, there is a lot of, uh, there are about 100 out, out of the lists. That means the persons who were uh, judged, who were cured, who were punished uh, in the public out of the past as well as the private out of the past. Then there is an inventory. When the first inquisition uh, was first closed, in, that was in 1774, an inventory was made of all the documents available with the inquisition for her place. These documents were, were kept right in, a, uh, in a very secretive location. There was one room called the Secreto. This was in the Botlinger, you know, the Sabayo Palace of the place where the uh, inquisition operated from. I will come to that in a little later, the, the vote line there, because it's quite interesting to know these things here. It has disappeared now from, uh, the building is no more there. So, there were, it was kept, kept securely locked, and there were three keys, only three keys. One each with the two inquisitors, and the third one was with the promoter. Now, the promoter is the prosecuting uh, lawyer, if you want to call it. Uh, totally in this hotel anger, there would have been less than 100 employees. The Inquisition never had more than that many. I think it was maybe closer to about 50, 60. That list I have given in the book. You can access it. You can also access it from the door of the home. Uh, primarily, there were different uh, um, officials over there, but headed by the first Inquisitor. Now, the second place you get two very valuable documents is in the Biblioteca Nacional de Portugal in Lisbon. One is uh, called the Reportorio. That was uh, compiled by one of the inquisitors, uh, Figuera. Uh, he compiled it in 1623, uh, in which there are about 3,444 names. <coughs> and uh, this again gives a list of all those who were prosecuted by the inquisition up to that time. This document uh, uh, you can't download it as such because it has, but it has been digitized. And, uh, but what you can do if you're interested in getting these names, and they, you may find some interesting names because they're quite a few from Madonna, which is my ancestral place, uh, which is uh, very interesting because uh, there's some of the same names appear in Kankar's Torre de Adona, you know, the Tombo de Adona. Uh, and uh, one of them is the first name is Lorenzo Carajo, who was the first uh, man from uh, Angora. I'll come to that a little later. But this uh, list of these names have been compiled and put into an Excel document, which is available in the repository of Sao Paulo University in Brazil. And this is accessible, it, it is open to all, it is accessible to you. So if you're interested, download the document, have a look and see these things. The same library also has another book compiled by a gentleman called Antonio Muriara around 1860 or so, you know, or 1880, something like that, the exact name, Pang got. And this gives a number of auto uh, he lists, he had handwritten notes. Some of them you will find in the Torah del Tom, but some you don't find them there. Obviously, when he wrote these, these documents were available. Where are they now? I don't know. Some of them. Uh, maybe they will be uh, discovered and maybe more will be discovered. So we will have more information in future when uh, some other person can take it up and write these things again. So, there are a lot of information. Then when this uh, inquisition was finally permanently closed, that was in 1812, uh, the, the, the secret door was uh, closed and there was a, uh, one of the promoters was asked to compile which, because there were huge files, a lot of case files and other things, uh, what was important and the, the rest, I'm not sure what happened but they have disappeared. Maybe they were burned, we don't know. Uh, about 2000 documents were sent to Rio de Janeiro and these are available again online. Anybody who wants to access, access them can do so. I've given the uh, websites in my book and I'm happy to tell anybody what they are if they ask me directly. Uh, 
so you can get about 2000 documents there which gives you some interesting things. So going through all these uh, primary sources, uh, plus there is a lot of uh, information and a lot of new scholarly studies done by young Portuguese and Brazilian scholars, plus a few Indians as well who are doing these things and others as well. There is an Italian gentleman called Marcoci. Uh, and this gave through very interesting insights in different aspects of the Inquisition. Now let's come down to what I've learned. You see? And uh, if you will excuse me if I refer to these notes. I'm getting a little old, so I can't remember everything. Now, the first thing that hits you straight in your face is the Inquisition was reported to the Portuguese king. It got its legitimacy from the Pope, but it reported to the King. It was an instrument of the King. It was an instrument that was used, the premier institution that was used to promote a policy of trying to integrate the vast diverse populations that were there in the Portuguese uh, overseas. Uh, I, I won't call it empire or anything, because it was just some outpost as such spread all over the world. Uh, right from Macau to Brazil, Africa, Goa as well. And Goa was made the headquarters for this investigation. The aim was to impose a kind of social discipline and uh, act as a health force for Christians. Now the Inquisition never uh, was meant primarily for Christians. It was not meant for non-Christians unless, unless they came in the way of the Inquisition or they uh, were seen as uh, trying to um, divert Christians away from what they, was considered the uh, religion of the state at the time. Now, if Francis Xavier, there's a lot of said about him being a primary agent of the Inquisition. He was a Spaniard. The Inquisition was a Portuguese institution, the one in Goa's Inquisition. A Spaniard did not have anything to say in the policy. He was sent to India by the king to uh, uh, spearhead some of the evangelization and he didn't stay very long in Goa. He, he went on from, uh, from Goa to the uh, west, the east coast and then from there to uh, uh, Malacca and beyond and he died on, uh, in this thing. Now, the only sort of uh, reference I find because I, I, I've read the letters of Francis Xavier and other things. Uh, the only reference that I find is a letter that he wrote from Malukas. Malukas is in modern day Indonesia. Uh, in 1546, in which he suggested to the king that he send the Inquisition uh, to the east, that is to Asia, uh, because there were a lot of Jewish and Muslim influences that were affecting Christians here. He never mentions Hindus. The, the term Hindu was not invented at that time. The term for uh, these people like Gentiles, that means Gentiles or worshippers of idols. Uh, so that was all he, he said. So now, now you see, if you look at the first 40 years, and this is very clearly given in the in Figueras report of your. The statistics are very clear. The Inquisition's first effort was directed almost entirely against towards the in suppressing of the Novos Christos. Who are these Christos Novos? They were converts of, of Jewish and Muslim converts. Uh, Muslim converts were called Moriscos, and uh, they they were the descendants of these converts and these conversions had taken place in Portugal. In Portugal, yes, they were, they were uh, forced into it or expelled. And a lot of them took freedom and came down to Kuchin and Goa. If you look at the statistics of the first 40 years, that was, I told you, about 3,440 names or such. About 27 of this number, I, I calculated this, were prosecuted for what was called Kalpas de Mauro, that is Islamism. Islamism, you see, right, right from Europe to 
from the Ottoman Empire right down to uh, Gujarat and everywhere else, uh, it was heavily dominated by Muslim and Islamic uh, rulers. So, a lot of people uh, coming on the way may have been shipwrecked or converted to Islam, then they came down to Goa, so you have got some supplied armaments, some went over and helped these things. So, these were all related to Kalpas de Moro. So, 27% is the highest number were prosecuted for this. Judaism, 18%. So these were the highest numbers that were prosecuted. Okay? What is known as Dhindirita, that means for crimes related to the Gentile religions, like worshipping in temples, for Christians, mind you, you know, uh, if Christians went and did these things, so the war, pagan clothes, I mean, different clothes or, or violated some of the social norms that were created, then that came under something called Dhindirita, and that those statistics increase only from the 1600s onwards. Now again you see one coincidence here. Why? Why not before? Why not? Okay. So, so the main thing would be that during this time, it coincides with the Dutch fleet arriving of Goa. And this created a lot of social uh, I and mean, political unrest among the uh, king and the Portuguese, and they wanted to secure their hold over the uh, local populations. So you, that that is one of the explanations. They they were others as well. Now, when, when you come to the world Bank, you know it, this building was located just next to the Sai Cathedral. It was former Adil Shah's palace, and then it was taken over by the visitors. And uh, they, they built a prison at the back and the administrative building in the front. And in this administrative building, uh, the offices of the, uh, the different buildings of the administrators were on the second, first floor, where the inquisitor had well there. But very, very surprisingly, I don't know how many of you would, would be really taken back to this, the ground floor apartments were eight big rooms. There is a 1779 plan which says very clearly these rooms were rented out to Gentios always. So right within this great prison, what we think of and get scared of, there were shops there. And one of the shops was a butcher shop. This document is very clearly there in the Rio de Janeiro archives. And the inquisitors got uh, instruction from Lisbon to have the shop shifted. And it was not proper to have it in that building. So, you find that uh, all the elite sort of cooperated with Inquisition and it was not related to religion as such, though in different forms. For, for converts, of course, uh, there was no turning back. Once you are a Christian, you had to remain a Christian. So, the Inquisition acted as a sort of health code for them, which uh, sort of said, okay, don't deviate from this path. Now, in the provision council, provisional councils, which were there, uh, provincial councils that were held in the 16th century, uh, one of the directives was given that new converts should be treated with mildness. Whatever that term may mean, I'm not questioning that, but the term is used. And there, you can see that in the actions of the, uh, this thing, because they were given up to some uh, 10 to 20 years by which they could not be prosecuted for going into Jindalikar. Uh, they were also, for the first two offences, they received mild uh, sentences and it's only at the third time that they were prosecuted heavily for repetition. So, you can consider that that is the facts, you can take it in whichever way you want to look at. Now, I'll just give you two instances. Now, again, another thing is uh, about uh, one, one and a half percent of all the uh, number that were prosecuted were priests for various things, you know, like for heresy, wrong doctrine, some of them for sodomy, some of them for this sort of Indian Inquisition as well. So, you know, the, the Inquisition tried to keep discipline within its system. <coughs> you may ask, what were the numbers that were prosecuted? Now, the inventory gives a figure of about 16,800 or so. I have sat down and counted 
all the numbers that are there in the inventory, and my figure comes to around that figure, which coincides with what Bayao, Antonio Bayao, had written in his famous book in Portugal, in Coimbra University. Then I compared this with the all the parties. So when I compare these and put these together, the number increases. So my figure comes just short of 19,000, but again, some of the lists are missing. So when you put some averages and other things and make some statistical kind of uh, comparison, I, I think there would have been about uh, 22, 23,000 people who were over 250 years. And out of these, about uh, uh, 177 uh, that names are got who were executed, you know, burned physically. And uh, some of them were also burned in effigy or their bones were burned, those were dead or absent. Now, I'll just give you two examples. Uh, you know, which sort of justice and mercy, that is the motto of the Goa Inquisition. Now, when you look at uh, justice, there was a priest called uh, Zwam uh, Takasta, who was a serial sodomite. And he was um, uh, denounced. The trial lasted for about nine years, uh, nine, uh, nine months. And then the, the uh, papers were sent to Lisbon after he confessed. And from Lisbon came the directive you know, uh, carry out the sentence and he was executed. Uh, one paper says on Mandovi Gate, which is uh, in Old Goa, uh, which is uh, this one. Uh, the other is of an Ethiopian slave called Gabriel. Now, you know what slaves were? They were not treated as persons, they were treated as commodities. They were given only one name, Gabriel, no second name. Just to call like a dog, you call. That was a slave's position in Goa, not only in Goa, all over the world in that time. Now this Gabriel uh, was a Falasha Jew from Ethiopia who was captured as a slave uh, by Arabs and sold by Arabs and one of them brought him over to Amal Nagar, which is neighboring Chaul. Chaul. Now Gabriel converted to Islam and then from there he escaped and came to Portuguese Chaul. There he converted to Christianity. Then again he escaped to Amar Nagar. Then for some reason he came back. Uh, and uh, in the process, you know, he had committed a number of uh, offenses as per the laws of the Inquisition. That he had uh, gone over to Islam and then come back. He was a renegade and all that thing. He confessed. Now as per the uh, procedure laid down, he should have been executed. But the Inquisition, the Inquisitors, and after all, he was a slave. What does it matter? You know? no, nobody is going to ask for you. He doesn't have any family, he has nothing. But the inquisitors sent this case, asked the two interpreters, is this man in his right mind? Does he understand what he is doing? Then they, they gave their opinion. Then the case was still not satisfied, was sent to Lisbon for an opinion. And then he was sent to the galleys as a punishment, till the case for a verdict came back. But we know that this happened in uh, 1595, but we know that two years later there is some documentation saying that he was, the sentence had not been uh, carried out. We don't know much beyond, but somewhere we can find some documentation. So this is what is interesting. We have to revise our situation and come up with fresh opinions and change your opinions if, if the evidence shows that. I don't know how much time I've got. Five minutes. Okay, five minutes. Let me see what I can. Uh, now, the Inquisition was not the only court here. There were three different courts. It was one of three courts. One was the civil court, the Relesham. Then you had the ecclesiastical court, which dealt with church matters. Then you had the Inquisition court. The Inquisition court dealt with only certain matters, like heresy, bigamy, sodomy, because sodomy was considered uh, uh, a violation of the natural law, that is God's law. So it was considered treason. So they were treated quite harshly. False testimony uh, and, and these sort of things. Gentile Dhar, of course, most, most of them related to uh, these sort of things. You know, when going to the... Uh, 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 carrying out sacrifices uh, at temples or in the house, keeping idols in the house and that sort of thing. And the punishments for these vary. A lot of them considered what was called uh, spiritual penances. Those who were new were given instruction in the monasteries or in certain things. And they were, uh, the main, uh, this one was uh, public humiliation. You wore a 
costume of infamy. You know, in certain cases you wore a karocha like a dust dense cap, you flip like this. Then you wore, wore a, a long jacket over your this one, which is uh, San Benito, if you were to be uh, 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 not condemned, or if you were condemned, you wore the Samara, which had flames and other things. And then if you were, should have been condemned, but you were uh, 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 not for, the, for that particular occasion, you had what is called the Samara Fogo Rubolto. That means the flames pointed downwards, which meant you spent this time, but you do it next time you are out. It was a suspended sentence in a way. Uh, you know, Bardes and Aldona, they, they revealed a very interesting case of Inquisition. Aldona contributes about 1%. That is my ancestral place. Uh, I think I'm running out of time, so I, if people are interested, this document is already posted online. You are welcome to have a look at it or you can further information in the book. So I'll just conclude with one more thing. My ancestors left Aldona, uh, I think it is around 1700, you know, and we settled down near Mangalore. And uh, my quest was to find out if I could find any names there. I could not. So. We, we were not prosecuted, none of them were uh, this one. So with this I will just conclude this and give it to Jason to take it further. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you But uh, again, these questions I will confine only to what I know and to these topics I will not be taken into anything uh, of other things. Okay, thank you. as many of us would believe. 
there's a lot of uh, uh, work out there. Unfortunately, because it's Brazilian and Portuguese, Italian scholars, the work tends to be in Italian or in Portuguese. And in Goa, we've lost the linguistic capacity to read uh, stuff uh, in, in Portuguese. But there is, there is material here. Um, and um, I should also point out that there was an interesting series of uh, uh, interviews with scholars who have done work uh, conducted by Dale Muniz, it's Dale Luis Muniz of the Al Sulaj Collective, which is also freely available online. So I'd encourage you uh, to go and um, listen to those interviews as well. Um, rather than go through the issues that I, 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 I uh, noted down, um, I'll just go to the, the house rules. So first, let's bear in mind uh, that the moderator's voice is final. Uh, the moderator is acting here as a representative of the, uh, the hosts of this private property. Right? So just bear that in mind. Um, so the when I, when I as moderator request you to stop, please stop. Yeah. Um, what we will be doing is I will take questions in groups of three. When you articulate your question, you first indicate your name. If you have some kind of institutional affiliation, you do that as well. Uh, collect three and then we uh, pose it to the speaker. Um, these need to be clarifications uh, and not speeches. If it is a speech, I'm going to ask you to please stop. Yeah, and you will respect my request. Um, like I said before, we're not here to establish the truth. We are to clarify our um, uh, questions about the position uh, raised here today. Um, right, so let's take uh, the first set of three questions. Oh, just one second. When, uh, when do we end? 7, 10. Oh, okay. So, first three questions. Uh, your name, one, this one, one, one in, advising two, number two. Anyone else? Right at the back, that gentleman there. Okay. Um, is there a mic going around? <coughs> there is. So, this gentleman here. With your no institutional affiliation, I would like to know what cases you have gone through number of records in Portugal, in Lisbon. Uh, I would like to know the infamous case of Garcia the Orta. Now, Garcia the Orta, uh, actually, he was a Christian Lohu, and his daughter, uh, sorry, his sister was burned at stake in Goa because of conf uh, some confessions made and it appears that because of her confession Garcia was, the author was already dead but his body was exhumed and again consigned to frame and in refugee. Now do you, uh, I got this information from a number of sources now and uh, Octavio Paz, the famous uh, Mexican author once said these confessions were so brutal that normally the people will confess anything you want him to confess and they will imagine what the, their tormentors want to know and they will confess and it seems that his, his sister had confessed that uh, uh, Garcia the author also used to practice some rituals which are typical of Jews uh, Thank, thank you for your question. You are right that uh, Katrina was burned. Uh, but uh, I would suggest that if you are interested in it, the whole process file, a trial case, is available in the Tohede Tong archives. And then you can decide for yourself whether it was brutal or non-brutal or whatever. I would not trust a Mexican author to know what is happening here because that is the historical process. You can judge for yourself. And the second thing in this judgment, please go back, no WhatsApp, no nothing today, no this one, go back to a time three, four hundred years back and try to imagine that time and then understand the process of what's going on. Okay? Uh, yes, Garcia was a famous, uh, this one, 
and uh, if you want to, uh, I've given a little bit in my book about it, not a lot, uh, but if you're interested, you can read that and there are further references where you can get this forward. Uh, I'd also like to add this point. On the case of Garcia the author, or his sister Katrina, Katrina the author's uh, case, the entire judicial process actually has been um, transcribed and there are two Portuguese uh, scholars, women who have worked on it. And um, yes, Miguel Lorenzo. Miguel Lorenzo also has worked on it. But these two women have been interviewed by again Dale Luis Menezes. Once again, it's available on YouTube. So I encourage you to go and get the more information on this there. And also, they would have written papers, so that's also available. And I want to pick up also on the point of Uttavi Paj. Now, I'm not familiar whether Octavio Paj was in fact anti clerical But like our friend, what's his name there? Punya. Tristan. Bragasa Punya. Bragasa Punya. These are anti clericals These are men very often, and this is very fashionable, Republicans uh, who were anti clericals the, the history of Mexico, for example, especially in the early uh, 20th century, is a history of violent anti clericalism just as it's the history of Portugal in the early 20th century. I mean, even the 19th century, ever since the constitution of the monarchy, you have these waves of anti clericalism So, once again, I want to go back to what we said about sources. When we go to sources, go to the primary source, rather than relying on Tawe Paj, on Raghansa uh, Kunya, or when we look at these people, we also do a research on these people and their agenda, their political location. This is what a good historian would do. Um, so I will stop there because I don't want to take the limelight away from the speaker. The second was Mr. Barwe. Is that correct? Is that you? Second Barwe in New York. This is regarding lovely people. Governor in 1567 instructed to make an inventory of all villages regarding demolished temple and their property. Was it due to inquisition? The inquisition never, as far as I know, never gave an order for demolition of temples.
you know, there were a lot of, uh, uh, you know, for instance, the Chalukya temples uh, were, de were demolished by the Cholas and other things like that. So it's a very complex issue which cannot be discussed in some small thing like this and we are not such great scholars. It, it requires a lot more study before we comment. So I'm not going to comment further on that. Thank you. You know, sometime, uh, I think early on in my academic uh, life, I learned this one lesson is that the, um, the true scholar is not afraid of saying, I don't know, right? Um, so you know certain things and you speak about it and those you don't know, you just say, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a scholar on this early modern history, uh, but I have done some work on the Kumidar uh, history and it seems to me that this kind of thing is really the desire of the, 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 the state to figure out what land is temple, what land is not, or former temple, and what can be taxed is a question. It seems to me the issue is one of taxation rather than of cultic uh, practice. Yeah. Thank you. There was a hand that was raised at the back over there. Was it Father Jason Pinto? Yes, so Father Jason Pinto. <laughs>